Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to the TRG webinar series. Presented by the Brain and Mind Center, I am the co-host, Khalil Philander. I'm an assistant professor at Washington State University. Uh, my other co-host is Sally Gainsbury at the University of Sydney. I will pass the conversation over to her in a minute, but first, um, let me just plug a few things. One, um, we want to get more topics from diverse speakers, so if you do have any ideas, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, with any of those ideas. Two, if you have any questions for today's speakers, please pop those into the chat thread. Um, we always like to get banter from everybody who is involved in the wider TRG community. So without further delay, I will pass the conversation over to Sally Gainsbury to introduce today's speakers. Sally. Thank you very much, Khalil. So I'm Sally Gainsbury. I'm professor in the School of Psychology at the University of Sydney. And I'm the leader of the technology addiction team, which is bringing these webinar series through the Brain and Mind Center. So today I am very delighted on this topic of low risk gambling guidelines, which is something I've been fascinated with and read a lot about. But we have the source themselves, the people who have been intimately involved with developing uh, low risk gambling guidelines. So I'm very pleased to be joined uh, by Professor David Hodgins, who I have known for a long time, and he will be well known to everybody in the gambling field for his work on everything from uh, treatment and non-treatment seeking recovery, uh, you know, a plethora of information on, on the processes and development of gambling problems and the recovery and prevention and treatment mechanism. So David is a professor at um, the University of Calgary. I'm also joined by Professor Nikki Dowling at Deakin University, who has been working on low-risk gambling guidelines in addition to many other topics, but we'll, we'll stick to that one. But she's also done a lot of work most recently on scalable and online digital interventions for the treatment and uh, prevention of gambling harms. And I'm very pleased to be joined by uh, Dr. Stephanie McBurris, who is also at Deakin University, a lecturer, and she also holds a, a, a postdoctoral fellowship from the Office of Responsible Gambling in New South Wales. So thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, again, anyone watching, if you have any questions, please put them in early. Often we get a run of questions at the end, which we don't get always time to go through. So if you have a question for our experts, pop it in now or as we go through. Um, David, I'd like to start with you. You're really one of the, the first people in the field to look at this topic of low-risk gambling guidelines. Can you tell us a little bit about that, that background of how this, how this research has come about and how it has evolved over, um, has it been, it's been over 10 years now, I believe. Yeah, I'd say it's closer to 20 years that we've been working on the methodology, at least of, you know, how, how you might go about this. And, uh, you know, I was thinking earlier, you know, I think the origins were really from a clinical perspective to try to understand if somebody cuts back on their gambling, is there a level that is unlikely to cause them problems? And there was a little bit of research in that area, but then there was a, a shift to more of a public health perspective and, you know, really trying to answer the question of whether we had good enough um, descriptive data about people's gambling and the harms associated with people's gambling to uh, derive reliable indicators of you know, where the, the tipping points are in terms of when people might uh, begin to develop uh, problems. And so really the first few studies were really more about methodology and you know, really trying to answer the question of whether this was possible. And it seemed like it was possible um, although every database that was used was, um, you know, had some flaws. Um, and, you know, at the end of each of the articles and, and projects, we were never confident enough to say these should be the, the lower risk guidelines um, because we, you know, as researchers, we were wanting to be careful and, you know, we weren't sure how, how well they would generalize beyond a particular piece of data that we had um, and so forth. So um, in terms of convergent validity, you know, other people like Nikki and um, others around the world sort of began to do similar types of analysis and often identical analysis. Um, uh, so we could kind of see whether there was any validity in terms of, you know, finding similar things in different places. And uh, that really spawned the, the, the most recent project we did where we actually more formally um, 
exam looked for databases around the world that were of reasonable quality that provided the right measures um, and we um, uh, partnered with the people associated with those different um, um, databases and all did identical analysis so we could kind of more systematically look at you know is there any kind of convergence and what you know what would happen and we really didn't expect that it would be perfect um, but uh, we had, so we were actually surprised with just how similar the uh, lower risk guidelines were from different data sets in different parts of the world. So the data sets were widespread, but you know limited in some ways. So um, there were a number from Europe and North America, Australia, New Zealand, uh, but none from Asian countries, and they were all sort of higher income uh, countries as well. So it's still limited, and we still needed to we need to be careful about it. But uh, given the similarity in the results, we you know, feel more confident in promoting the notion that there are some, some cut points that uh, um, are reasonably reliable and good indicators for industry, individuals, and so forth. And, and can you just clarify for me, with the low-risk gambling guidelines, you're looking at the absence of problems, so, you know, low or no PGSI scores, as opposed to I guess that, you know, there's this conversation of this like risk spectrum of gambling. Some people say all gambling is potentially harmful. So if you gamble at all, you're, you're automatically at risk. We're having a lot of talks about, about harm. So you can have gambling harm, even if you don't have gambling problems. And then there's a the talk about, you know, positive play. And these are the characteristics of, you know, sustainable and safe gambling. So when we're looking at the low risk gambling guidelines, what is it that someone who gambled with the, at the low risks how, how would you define that group or what, how would you characterize and describe that? Yeah, so it's really it's a really good question. So actually one of the shifts we made was in our language. So we we moved from low risk to using using the descriptor lower risk. And that's really in recognition that there is, you know, there are some individuals who experience harm at actually very low uh, involvement with gambling. So, um, I mean, you could, uh, you know, argue that there's no safe gambling from that perspective, and we don't want to make that argument, but we want to acknowledge that it really is a continuum of risk. So we, we, we just described as lower risk. In our um, focus groups around how people uh, who gamble at different levels responded to um, lower risk guidelines, we found that the assumption people made was that what we're talking about is gambling addiction. And we were trying to direct people um, to gamble in a way that they're not gonna get into um, an addiction with gambling. That's actually not what we were uh, doing at all. We were re really looking at harm indicators. So, um, uh, so you know, the, the concept of harm, of course, is, has gotten much more sophisticated over the last bit. But we have always looked at, you know, whether, uh, you know, what level of gambling would prevent harms associated with gambling as opposed to, to gambling addiction. The reality is that uh, the analysis relies on community survey data, so epidemiological data, and very few, few epi epidemiological studies have good measures of harm. Uh, but many have measures like the Problem Gambling Severity Index. And if you look at items of that, a number, a number of them are specific indicators of different type of harm. And so we really um, looked at different ways of doing it, but we settled on using specific items of the PGSI that measure specific types of harm. Okay, that's, a so long, it, that's a long no, answer no, to and it's, it's like it, it is detailed, but it's important to get into the nuts and bolts and think about, is it, you know, are these safe? Are we telling people if you do this, you're fine? Uh, you know, that that messaging and what we're really talking about. And again, like you say, is this a clinical measure or a population measure? So, so Nikki, you know, you, you know, David, and you've seen this research coming out of Canada. You come from a clinical background, but obviously with a, with a leg in public health and things like that as well. So what were, you, what were you thinking when you saw this and how did you kind of pick it up and take it to next stages? Thanks, Sally. Um, yeah, I am a clinical researcher. Um, so I guess my interest in low risk limits or lower risk limits, as David calls them, um, is in secondary and tertiary prevention 
um, mostly. Um, I feel like limits have the potential to enhance people's readiness to change, um, gives them something to reflect upon um, in terms of their own gambling behaviour um, and, you know, therefore can potentially increase um, their motivation to use self-help strategies or seek support. Um, in prevention and treatment, I think there's a range of different ways that you can use them. Um, obviously, the primary one is to provide guidance, so we can use them to guide gamblers, but also clinicians and other stakeholders, um, like funding bodies of cl clinical services, um, about what actually constitutes lower risk gambling. So we can use the limits to really just provide sort of simple rules of thumb. Um, and we can do that in specific ga gambling contexts. So, you know, they are often used in venues now here in Australia um, and online platforms as well. So um, they can be really helpful if a gambler is trying to um, set some limits. Um, so they might be using a formal pre-commitment type scheme um, or they might just have some limits in their mind about, you know, how much they want to spend and, and how often they want to gamble. Um, and for me, I found them really helpful in clinical settings because it helps our clients to set non-abstinence treatment goals we used to call controlled gambling. Um, and we didn't have a lot before some of this stuff came out around what people should be trying to, what limits they should be setting for themselves. Um, and so I really like that, that there's, it sort of gives us a little kind of starting point to, to talk about what might be um, lower, harm, less harmful gambling, um, particularly if you've had um, some level of problem in the past. But they can also be used in a whole other range of ways. We can use them for screening, you know, for example, you know, very brief um, instruments to screen in mental health services, alcohol and, and drug services. Um, we can use them as inclusion criteria, you know, eligibility criteria for prevention or treatment programs. Um, we can use them in sort of um, brief interventions. Um, so personalised feedback, for example, where does my gambling sit relative to other people's? Um, and potentially we can also use them as treatment outcome measures. You know, how, how much are they sticking under or over um, that limit that they've set for themselves? And just again, and one other question about what they do and don't mean. So people who gamble above the low risk gambling guidelines, it doesn't necessarily mean they're problematic or they're going to develop a problem. No, not at all. So the limits are actually um, uh, developed according to what we call sensitivity and specificity. So sensitivity is how often um, a limit sort of correctly um, identifies people who are experiencing gambling-related harm and specificity is the limit, um, ability of a limit to accurately identify people who are not experiencing gambling-related harm. So basically, no matter where you draw that line on that continuum that David was talking about, no matter where you put that threshold, there will be people who are sort of incorrectly classified, I guess. There'll be people who are true positives, people who are actually experiencing harm um, and that have been picked up by those limits, they're exceeding those limits, but there'll also be false positives, so people who exceed the limit um, but aren't experiencing harm. So, um, you know, it's, it's sort of a bit of a, you've got to, you've got to draw the line somewhere to develop a limit. There has to be a threshold of some level, but it's not 100% by any means. There are always going to be people over and above um, under and under and over the limit that are sort of you know in the wrong spot yeah definitely I'm, I'm going to circle back to your clinical use of them and how people I'm keen to know how people are responding to them uh Steph you can throw this question back to to Nikki or, or David can you actually for the for the audience tell us what the low risk gambling guidelines are uh, which ones? <laughs> We've got a few. Um, out there. <laughs> one, like they you know, give us give us a broad, uh, you know, a ballpark range. Like, what are we talking about when we're saying these are the low risk gambling guidelines? Okay, so when we're talking about the new limits that David and his team have actually developed, so thankfully I printed these out and have them in front of me because I feel I thought a question like this might come up. Um, so David and his team are looking at. Um, actually, let me clarify. Actually, we have limits across. Uh, different gambling behavior indices, right? So we do have gambling frequency, gambling expenditure expenditure as a proportion of income and number of gambling activity related limits. So um, when it comes to David and his um, international team, they came up with gambling frequency limits of five to eight times a month. Um, whereas in Australia, um, the team led by Nikki, which I was a part of as well, um, we had limits that range from 1.6 to 3.1 times per month. 
when it comes to expenditure, David and his team had 60 to 120 Canadian dollars monthly. Um, whereas for us here in Australia, it was 32 to 45 Australian dollars per month. So I'm not sure about the conversion, apologies for that. Um, and again, David and his international team, when it comes to expenditure as a proportion of income, it was one to 3% of gross monthly income. Um, whereas we had in Australia 0.83 to 1.68% of gross personal income. Um, and the number of gambling activities, uh, with David and his team, was three to four activities, whereas here in Australia we had two gambling activities. Okay. So then the obvious question is what are Australia, what's going on in Australia and, and why are there differences between populations? Yeah, that's a good question, which I think David and Nikki, please jump in as needed. But obviously there are um, some potentially slight differences in the methodologies that we've used as well. Um, I think one of the key things that David pointed out and Nikki has pointed out as well is just how we defined harm. Um, I'm pr pretty sure we were actually consistent in using the PGSI negative consequence items. Um, and in Australia, we I think it was the limit was at two or more items, I think it was, Nikki, two or more harms that we were developing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We, we used a range of different harm indices in the original yeah. project um, and we had different sort of ways of defining harm because we wanted to see whether that actually influenced anything. Um, but it turns out that they are actually pretty consistent and they're actually quite consistent with Can the Canadian guidelines as well, not the international guidelines, shouldn't you call them Canadian guidelines? Yeah. Um, um, you know, we're, there are ranges without a doubt. So our first project was um, to Australian states and territories. Um, and that's why Stephanie's giving ranges is because they actually, they, they're quite different in their gambling availability and the, the gambling practices of the people who live there. Um, and the demographics of the people who live in those states and territories is remarkably different, but they were relatively consistent. And I think ours were generally at the lower end of the original, but this was be, obviously happened before um, David did um, his uh, international study. Um, but um, they are actually relatively consistent, but they are sort of more, mostly presented as ranges because the different way that you do things results in slightly different um, limits. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. No, so, that's exactly right. And, and again, I'm curious, I can't remember, David, how you and your team actually uh, clarified, classified harm, right? Because obviously we're saying we use the PGSI negative consequence items and we in Australia use that two plus as that cutoff. Yeah, um, so the, we, we also used two plus, plus we looked at individual harms and, and actually found it pretty consistent with different indicators. Um, but, you know, that, you know, the description that Stephanie provided um, illustrates one of the challenges, which is how, how do you create a public health message with that level of complexity you know you've got a number of different indicators you've got ranges you've got you know different definitional uh, issues around what is a harm and what's a type of gambling and so forth so the next kind of phase of what we did was to try to refine that into a, a, a simpler message and so at the end of the day what we boiled it down to and this was based mostly on canadian validation studies so you know whether it uh, you know fits uh internationally, I think is a bit of a research question really. But you know, at the end of the day, it was um, if you gamble no more than four times a month, so no more than weekly, um, and no more than 1% of your gross family income, and no more than two types of gambling, then you're at lower risk of developing a problem. And if you exceed those guidelines, any of those guidelines or all of them, then the, incre then the risk has increased. And when we, so we found that people could understand that, um, people in the general public could understand that. Um, we did need to provide them with a little guidance about how to think about 1% of their gross family income. You know, that's because that's a complex, um, uh, more complex uh, um, concept. Um, but people generally seem to be able to understand that um, and found uh, that. Um, People in general thought it sounded about right. You know, they didn't think that it was either too high or too low. Most people felt like it was a reasonable, you know, a reasonable limit to set. People who were high on PGSI, you know, showing indications of problems, they were more likely to say, well, maybe they're a little bit, uh, you know, too low. Um, but uh, generally, people were pretty satisfied with them. That's really interesting to find. So the, so the general community, um, but 
yeah, I'm interested in people who are gamblers. And, and maybe, Steph, you can, before we get too much into that, you know, what what are the uses? How is this? How are these being applied? What what should we do now? We have these. Like, presumably, we'll continue to refine them. But what, what do we do? We've got ballparks now. What what do we do? Well, I guess we need to try to disseminate them, potentially. <laughs> Right. It's about coming up like, again, we've developed low risk limits, much like low risk um, drinking limits. Right. But the next step is to actually develop guidelines that can then be disseminated and promoted to the public. Um, And as Nikki mentioned as well, for use in um, clinical um, aspects, too. So the next thing is really to. to figure out the best approach like as david said he, like you know having these ranges is a bit hard to um for the public to understand but boiling it down to clear messages and um you know saying no more than two more activities no more than x no more than y um is um something that we need to do in um in australia especially but also um, um in other countries internationally too it's about really thinking and i think it's really important because we did um uh, as part of our research, we also did an opinion survey with ex- experts in the field as well as um, the public, and we found that whilst they, um, like whilst our Australian limits also had face validity, they were also saying, "Yep, yeah, these look like they're they're just about right." There was a lot of concern about the wording around it and any caveats that needed to be clearly stated as well. Again, focusing on, you know, increasing your risk of harm. Not that you're definitely like you're not and not using terminology like you should not gamble. You should not gamble more than this. Like you know, don't use terms like that when you're disseminating this kind of information. It's all, um, it's all about yeah, like appropriate wording and appropriate caveats when um, when we're disseminating this. So I think the next step for us is really to see how we can work with work with government, work with appropriate bodies, reach out to consumers again, make sure we're getting this wording right and getting this dissemination promotion material right so it can be used um, for public health messaging and across clinical and um, other services as well. Yep, and then the next challenge is evaluating whether the dissemination worked. <laughs> Are they, <laughs> they even aware of it? <laughs> these aren't small considerations that, you know, if it is a public health um, campaign, then there really does need to be a dissemination, well thought through dissemination plan, as Steph's saying. Um, but also then, you know, how do we measure that? You know, do we, how do we assess its impact? You know, um, can the message inform people? Can it convince people? Can it, you know, is it credible? Can it influence their behaviour? Um, I mean, essentially, you know, does the target audience, which, is, you know, again, is a, a matter of argument and debate about who you should actually be targeting this to, do they hear it? Do they correctly interpret it, as David said, you know, you know, um, and then when they do that, does that actually change anything in terms of their behaviour? So, um, so it's not just sort of developing the plans and the materials and deciding who is going to be responsible for that, but then also, um, you know, what impact that might have had on different, you know, groups of people. That's, and I think that's really interesting, this idea. Is this sort of a, a population-wide, um, potentially, you know, youth, you know, before people ever start gambling, they sort of yeah, learn these limits, you know, this is what you do to stay safe. Um, is it a target audience where you get people who are regularly gambling? And um, I think that would be, a you know, a confrontational message. If you're a regular gambler, the gambles are much, much, much exponentially higher than this. Your, your tendency, cognitive dissonance, would be to dismiss that. I know, especially, like, so... We have a problem with, uh, you know, acceptance of recognition of harms. And and harms are a little bit uh, difficult to define for an individual because often the harms are maybe, a, we someone might say they are accumulating harms, such as, you know, not developing relationships or not saving money, but that individual in the moment doesn't necessarily feel that harm or experience the harm that's kind of, kind of similar to smoking, I suppose, in, in some way. So we're not, we're not completely out of the blue um or is it like now there's much more focus on using things like limit setting so systems and technology has improved so we can set limits on most forms of gambling now is this something that i've always had an issue with saying i'll just set a limit and leaving that to the individual with no guidance whatsoever so this could be a potentially useful adjunct set a limit just so you know here are the low risk gambling limits or or maybe that default limit is is put in place or do we just cap people at that level you know and say that that's it. You know, some jurisdictions do have mandatory caps on, on gambling spend. So, so, you know, to what level do we, who do we target? What do we do with it? Well, I think, you know, you, the, that latter kind of um, uh, category of possibilities is one I think I would really like to see us move to. So that, you know, people are, uh, 
provide it, at least provide it with this information in helping them set personal limits. And, you know, I think there are lots of um, cultural differences in terms of where that could be imposed versus invited and uh, suggested and so forth. But I think it provides a framework that could be used to help guide people uh, to, you know, appropriate, you know, reasonably safe limits. So I, I think that's a direction. You know, at the public health kind of part of this, um, you know, I, I don't know that it's realistic that we would expect that people are going to necessarily change their behavior based on learning and understanding these limits. Um, you know, I, I think the outcome, which, you know, I'm not quite sure how to measure, is really how much do, the, do they contribute to a culture of moderation? You know, that somehow the this information seeps into the public awareness around gambling so that you know, people understand that there are risks, they understand that there are, you know, there's levels that are, you know, going to increase risk, and they have a good, a bit of a sense of what those are. Um, when we were beginning this research, and we were, um, we were doing some survey work, um, and we had a large sample of people who gamble, we asked them about Canada's um, drinking guidelines, because we wanted to, you know, get a sense of, you know, the degree of awareness and, you um, you know, do people follow them? And uh, so we asked people about their drinking and about uh, whether they were aware of any guidelines. And people um, weren't aware that there were specific guidelines, but when they were asked to speculate on what lower risk drinking was, they came up with exactly the Canadian guidelines at the time. So it was kind of reassuring that, you know, somehow this seemed to, they seemed to have the right information, even though they couldn't cite that, you know, the, you know, Canadian Medical Association had endorsed this lower risk drinking guideline um, kind of thing. So, um, and, you know, and that's not to say that people were sticking within the guidelines necessarily, but they were aware of it. And I think, you know, contributing to a, a sense that, we should be thoughtful and, you know, we should be moderate in our approach. You know, we should be, um, you know, treat gambling with um, the sensitivity that it deserves. Yeah, and I, I'd agree with that, that I, I'm just coming back to your point, um, Sally, about the cognitive dissonance. Um, that's actually kind of important, you know, like we know look, there's, a, you know, there's whole interventions and treatments around providing people with normative data. This is what the rest of the population do. And we know people who have problems with their gambling often um, socialise with other people or have a lot of contact with other people who gamble. Um, and clinically, it's always really interesting when you talk to people, because my, my very, very, my PhD project was on controlled gambling. And when we started, that, that is setting some limits. It is saying some level of gambling is acceptable, what is that to you? Um, and when, we, you know, as we were talking, it's really interesting um, watching some people's reaction that, that perhaps $50 a week even, um, which was sort of our maximum um, in that particular study, um, was was shocking to them, you know, um, and the, the idea of doing that. And, and inevitably what they kind of went was, well, it's not, it's not worth bothering to do that. You know, like it's, um, there's no point in doing that. I may as well just quit. Um, and so I come back to David's point around culture. And I think that's really, really important. Um, and, you know, David kindly invited me to present at his Banff um, conference um, this year. And we had a panel similar to this one. And, and we started talking about things like, um, you know, in, in Australia, we have things like dry July, where, you know, we're encouraged just to just to go easy for a little bit in terms of alcohol consumption. Um, and that there's nothing similar to that um, in, in terms of gambling. And so I think this is this is right. It's just sort of seeping into the consciousness of people um, around, you know, what is less harmful. Um, of gambling. And, and so how are people, so we have spoken about sort of the credibility and the uptake and the acceptance, um, and it it is something that's going to change over time. And is there any risk, I'm just sort of thinking of the counter arguments that people will say, oh, this is going to promote gambling because you're saying there's a safe way to do it, whereas, you know, there's certainly an argument that all gambling is is harmful and you shouldn't gamble at all um is there a sort of a tension between promoting a, a, a 
a risk and I guess that's the labeling like lower risk uh, so how do you kind of have those what are the communication considerations and that might differ between target populations yeah I'm going to hand this over to the expert <laughs> But I'll just I just want to say one thing quickly. I think um, I think it is a lot of it does revolve around the terminology, around how we word it, around um, about around just being really careful about making sure we are saying things like lower risk, as David said, and it's not that if you and it's if you exceed these limits, you are more likely to experience harm. It's you know those that kind of terminology. I think is just really really important. How we disseminate that will be really important. But I don't know if David and Nikki have anything to add. Yeah, I personally have I experienced no tension with people feeling like these promote gambling. The tension, if exists, is in the other direction of of um, people, you know, concerned that you know these are too low and they're dissuading gambling um, in a too conservative type way. Um, and you know that actually hasn't been as strong a reaction as we were anticipating because a lot of the people that were working on this project also had worked on alcohol guidelines where you know there's been you know very clear industry pushback um, on you know attempts to um, educate the public about lower risk drinking um, so that hasn't um, hasn't proven to be true um, in the Canadian context most provinces I think well I think most have picked the guidelines up and some sort of public health messaging. Um, and, uh, you know, I've only heard, um, you know, good things about that. I haven't heard um, much, uh, much uh, re negative reaction. Well, that's very, so that's very interesting. So that there is some push out in a public health endorsed by government way uh, I imagine industry stakeholders would have a massive problem with these guidelines um, they're very specific about the, the amount of money and the amount of time like that's bottom line stuff right there if there's not a lot of fuzzy you know just don't gamble responsible gambling you know gamble your way that's very fuzzy like there's not been a lot of pushback on that because it doesn't mean anything but this is a very specific bottom line figure that if everyone who gambled gambled at the levels that are prescribed, I imagine that would have a pretty substantial impact on taxation and gambling revenue. So I'm I'm surprised to hear there hasn't been more pushback. Mm -hmm. But I think yeah. this, is, this is where the dissemination comes. The dissemination and planning that you know well comes into it. That you have you know really clear thoughts about who is responsible for this, how it's going to be done you know, who the target audiences are, what the communication channels are going to be, you know, all of those factors um, and who's going to make all of these decisions and deal with any potential fallout that comes. Um, and I think that's, you know, I think one of the problems that we have, and, and I remember Matthew talking about this at Agri, David, was um, that, you know, this is the project and we finished the project and we're kind of doing the dissemination on top of, like, by the time the project has ended, if that kind of makes sense. Um, and so, you know, certainly here in Australia, there's been quite a lot of resistance um, from government. People like the idea and they want them, but then they're quite confronted by the limit. <laughs> there is a limit. Um, and, and certainly governments here in Australia have been thinking about the ways that they can sort of make this palatable um, across the board and, and who might need to be involved in terms of, of disseminating that information yeah. and I you know I think we've got a lot to learn so in the UK of course you know they're they're grappling with the role of gambling in society and you know what limits should be placed upon it and part of what they've they're doing is actually commissioning research on different aspects of it so um, a group uh, behavioral insights the behavioral insights team um, did a study to look to see um, how what, what the reaction to the UK public would be to the lower risk gambling guidelines. And they did a nice experiment. It was with an online panel of, of frequent gamblers uh, where they presented you know, some people with the lower risk gambling guidelines. Other people got more of a tobacco type message of you know, gambling can cause addiction, gambling can cause bankruptcy. Um, the third group got 
There's a public health industry based campaign called Time to Think in the UK. So take time to think about your gambling and uh, use some of the uh, safer gambling tools. Um, and then there was a control group that got nothing. And they you know, assessed a number of different dimensions. Um, and what was interesting was that you know, these different campaigns all had their strengths and weaknesses. So there wasn't, you know, they were all actually helpful in terms of in, in increasing people's awareness, but you know, the, uh, uh, the, lower, the lower risk gambling guidelines were associated with um, larger confidence in knowing what to do than the other campaigns, which makes sense. The time to think was um, rated as more motivational than the lower risk gambling guidelines. Um, and you know so forth. So there were different, you know, there were different um, reactions and different reactions of people in the panel that were already thinking of um, cutting back on their gambling compared to people who weren't. And so, you know, we have a lot to learn about the most effective way of doing this and how we can combine some of these different types of messaging um, and, and you know incorporate something that's specific like lower risk guidelines with something that's more motivational and um, you know, helpful for people. And that's really, I think that's a really useful part to bring up that it, it does have its role in different aspects. Like, is it a population wide, something you teach kids in school or is it something that we've found particularly for something like school education when people aren't involved in gambling, the specifics are just completely lost. Well, if they're not gambling at all, why would they remember how many times and the frequency it's just, well, like that's not the right message, but for someone who's actually trying to make a change um, or who is gambling and wants to make sure, you know, put a seatbelt on, make sure they're gambling. So then maybe the messaging has to be to the right audience for people who are actually seeking that information or at least it's relevant to them with some sort of comparison. So, for example, in Australia, we, um, there's been a mandated activity statement sent to everyone who has an online wagering account now once a month gets an activity statement emailed to them. Now they have to obviously open it themselves um, and they get one from each different account they have. So they have to add them all up. But um, it has a net summary, which is obviously about providing them more information about their spend, enhancing their awareness. But I think it would be interesting to think about the next step of behavioral science, similar to things like electricity bills and water usage, um, where it says, you know, you're a one person household. Do you know you're using as much electricity as a five person household? Or, you know, little smiley face, well done. You're being a really conservative, you know, socially conscious user. Congratulations. Like maybe there's this sort of messaging around so social norms, which has been really difficult in gambling because there's such a huge differential amongst the population. Like, do you know you're gambling? You've hit one out of, you know, five of the guidelines or, you know, you've hit four of them or you've hit none of them. Like, mm -hmm. so some, some sort of messaging like that with that, like, and how, how would regular gamblers at different levels, if you're a really highly involved gambler, how, how would you react to something like that? I think you bring up a good point, Sally, in terms of potentially having tailored messaging depending on the group, depending on who you're talking about. Um, but I think you bring up an interesting point about hitting the number of limits as well. So obviously I mentioned before that we have four different gambling behaviour indices that we have limits for. And I remember when these were our limits were actually presented at a conference once and there was an ex group of expert researchers that were actually confused by it as well. They just said, well, there's four limits. Are they mutually exclusive? If I hit two, am I more at risk than if I exceed one limit? You know, that kind of stuff. So I think it's also really important that we have a think about whether we even um, try to promote all four of these gambling behaviour indices or do we try to stick to a couple of key ones that are easily calculated um, or that might be more meaningful. So I know in our research, um, expenditure came up as one of the ones that were um, potentially more important, but expenditure is a proportion of income, potentially more, you know, more powerful because it takes into consideration your income as well. So I think that's um, just something I want to add to what you said there, Sally. And just picking up that point, like it, it's very clear, we're, we're often asked um, which limit should we use, you know, like the, there's sort of a pre-assumption that you don't have to disseminate all of the limits and when, which one is best. Um, and I think one important thing to note is that if you do exceed one of those limits, um, then you're very likely to exceed another one or more than one, another one. Um, and so, you know, the, the promotion of even one limit can can move people forward um, in terms of of um, their attitudes, I guess. But um, 
And I think the other thing to consider here is the use of individual gambling activity limits. Um, so there's, um, I know David's international team kind of pushed away from that, um, but we actually have, we noted quite stark differences in our attitudes by experts and our community in terms of whether um, individual limits are necessary, for example. Um, it's often difficult to find valid individual limits. We've done it twice now um, on three different data sets and it was almost like, you know, in, in study one, we got limits, valid limits for X, Y and Z gambling activities. And then for the other study, it was always the, all the other types of gambling activities. And so we have a set, but they're, they, they're coming from various sources um, and various types of analyses. So um, I think that push um, is reflected here in Australia where um, governments want to put this on, in their, their in their new messaging, for example. So mostly around electronic gaming machines or slot machines. Um, because they're considered to be the most sort of harmful form of gambling, and so you know, not not so not so worried about anything that's happening with lotteries or you know instant scratch tickets, for example. So um, I think it's also about um, you know which limit, which one can people kind of absorb, but also this is only one part of the puzzle. You know, as David said, there are potentially motivational aspects. Um, you know, for us, it was really nice to have something that added to those responsible gambling messages like don't chase your losses, don't drink while you gamble, don't do, don't do this, don't do that. And, and that's all well and good, but that's not particularly helpful either in terms of, you know, how do I not do something, um, you know, those sorts of things. And it's, it's sort of fairly equivalent to just telling someone to stop, um, which we know people you know, they have difficulty with that and they don't like hearing that message reasonably so. So I think it's sort of just, it's it's worth remembering that it's one piece of the puzzle and that this puzzle needs to continue to move um, forward in terms of how people can absorb the information um, and best turn it around to do something meaningful for themselves. Um, absolutely. And I, I'd be curious that, um, Nikki, if you have any experience from uh, from clinical experience or, or Steph or David from speaking with individuals about how they're reacting to these guidelines. When I first read them and compared them to, I guess, po clinical populations, but even just populations of regular people who gamble, um, you know, they do seem low. Uh, I think from a public health point of view, and I completely understand why a general population would see that as appropriate, um, but then also that argument that there is such a variance in discretional expenditure and time that I'm sure that it's a valid argument to say that someone could say, I gamble more than that, but I don't experience any harms. And maybe they just don't recognize the harms or maybe they truly don't. And they just, they just like to gamble. Like some people spend lots of money on lots of recreational activities that, um, you know, they get pleasure out or they enjoy and it serves them a purpose. So how do we kind of have this conversation with credibility when there are going to be, I don't know how many exceptions there are to the rule of people who can gamble at substantially more involved rates and not experience harm. So how much credibility do we have in the guidelines? I think we have a fair bit. I'll, I'll throw to the other guys in a moment. But I, I think that it is, like our, our research in Australia, there actually wasn't that much difference between people with gambling problems and those without them. Um, we actually gave them another set of limits as well, um, similar to what David was talking about before, that, you know, if you give different types of limits, and they actually thought they were sort of too high. Um, and so the, the, the in, in specific gambling activity limits are, are generally not as well accepted, um, particularly in our research. They, sort of, they, want, they, they thought those were too conservative, but the overall limits that Steph was talking about right at the start of the session, you know, are, are, are pretty, have pretty good face validity. So... Um, I think for us, it's about transparency. You know, how did we get to them? Again, this, this, you know, trying to communicate to people of, you know, we can enhance the credibility and the uptake by, you know, increasing the objectivity and transparency of how we, we developed them. You know, what methods did we use? What evidence they're based on? What judgments were made? Um, and, you know, this is not unique to low risk limits. This is, you know, health information generally, you know, um, in terms of whether the source of the information is credible and who is actually disseminating it. Do they trust the body of the, the organization, organizational body that is actually disseminating it? Um, you know, do they think it's complete? Do they understand it? Do they think it's relevant? You know, um, 
doesn't have enough depth that they can kind of go, oh, yeah, I, I get where that came from, but not too much depth that they get lost in the in the um, in the mess of things and the science of things. So I think it's uh, making important details of the development process available is also really important. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's a problem with all public health, you know, guidelines, right, is they're, they're really aimed at the average person, which is probably nobody. Um, so everybody's an exception in some way. And I think that people do react to them, my sense in that way. And they think about how they're similar and how they're different and, you know, whether or not they apply to them personally. And, but that's all a good process. Like that's what you want them people to the be. Point, doing, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and you know our, you know the our quantitative guidelines, you know, are combined with other pieces of information that are important. So we tell people, um, remind people that different types of gambling can be, you know, more or less harmful. We, you know, suggest that if you have, you know, concurrent problems with depression and anxiety. You may want to be more conservative in your gambling. Um, you know that um, you know if you have financial issues, then you know these guidelines may be too high, and, and so forth. So we try to provide a context and you know some structure for people to think about how much these apply to them. But um, I like the idea that they're thinking about it. Yeah, increasing awareness, great. <laughs> That's the key. <laughs> And that's, that's really helpful as well, because I think we've struggled a lot over the years with the gambling uh, field of not having any specifics of, of what does it mean to gamble at a lower risk level. Even the terminology, uh, you know, we, we are moving away, I'm pretty sure, from responsible gambling. That seems pretty accepted internationally now. Um, safer gambling, uh, sustainable gambling, um, you know, they have some positives because I do like the aspect of um enhancing you know as opposed to what especially what you, you guys were saying like don't do this don't do that I like the idea of providing people with a positive way to engage in a behavior so but I recognize that that might be implying that gambling is safe which again it's not so I think it's this tension between if you say something like risk uh, and harm you're risking uh, also alienating potentially some of the population that are just not um, accepting or seeing those harms. So I think we do need, I, I'm still a little bit on the fence about which terms. Um, I see things both both ways. Uh, and I, I, I think we'll have to see what happens with those sorts. But at least what we're thinking about or being cognizant of it. Um, what I really want to ask, and we're coming to the end, so <laughs> should governments put these limits in place? If these, if you're really saying, like, no, we're, we're pretty sure the evidence is still being refined. But at this point, if you're gambling more than this, you're, you're at risk. Should this be something that industry and government start acting upon that, you know, there are requirements, for example, in Australia and other jurisdictions not to serve people who are, appear intoxicated, you know, and there are requirements of gambling venues to and, and online gambling operators to actively identify people who are at risk and at harm and take some sort of intervention. Should this be something that if, you know, if you hit X, Y, like hit, start hitting the limits, you start getting cut off. I'm asking the million dollar question there. <laughs> I'm going to throw that one to David. <laughs> well, you know, it is, that is so far from a possibility in Canada that, you know, I, I can answer yes or no. Uh, <laughs> but really, um, you know, what I what I would like is serious endorsement and, uh, and uh, inclusion of this information in how we offer gambling. So, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that there should be strict limits because, you know, people will, there will be court cases immediately that, you know, these don't apply to me because I can afford to gamble more and so forth. And, and all of that's, you know, perfectly legitimate, but people should be aware and their, and their decision-making should be informed by this. Um, and, you know, I guess I'm, you know, Canadian enough that, you know, People need to decide for themselves, but you know, industry and regulators, you know, play a big role in helping people decide for themselves. And I think I'd like to see that part of it. Okay, and I'm going to ask specifically, you know, Magic Wish, how if you could have a public health or some sort of change, policy change, practice change, how would you specifically disseminate these? What are on the top of your wish list? Well, for me, it would be. Sorry, David. You, will you go ahead, Nikki? 
No, no, for me it would be public, like a, a, a broad public health campaign, you know, like I'm the same as David. I, what they were saying, they couldn't name the, the drinking limits. I can't name the drinking limits right off the top of my head either, but I know they're low. <laughs> I know that a lot of people I know exceed those limits, you know, so there's that awareness um, for me. And I think the, if, if you're targeting just people who are having harm from gambling, um, it, that's moving away from where we have been moving over the last decade or so, um, particularly in, in countries like you know Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, um, in terms of that public health perspective. Um, and people are also influenced by the people around them. So you know, if you uh, you know you might have somebody who is gambling with harm in your family, somebody else in that family kind of knowing vaguely that these are you know this is lower risk gambling and it's at this very low level um, can also influence other people around them. So I think for me, it's probably a whole of population, um, despite having a clinical kind of bent um, that, um, you know, but I think there is just so many ways you can use them. I think this is going to be the challenge of, of in what are we going to do? What is our plan for this particular target group of people? In the UK study that I was describing, where they presented different examples of uh, public health messaging, uh, one of the questions they asked was where the information should be provided to people. And uh, there, you know, there were various options, but the one that was most overwhelmingly endorsed was gambling venues. That that's where people are more likely to pay attention and to think about you know what how this applies to themselves and i i i, I buy that um so i'd like to see a, you know a focus there but i'd also like to see it integrated into the offerings of uh, the gambling offerings so that uh, people are even more nudged to pay attention to it and uh and, and you know incorporate it in their decision making yeah i agree with nikki i think the public health campaigns would be my wish list and ideal is I'd love to see instead of gamble responsibly at the end of every gambling advertising to be gambling more than X which would increase the risk of experiencing and the packaging yeah. yeah right like you've got yeah. like you say it's not two words like it is a more complex message and it's yeah. more complex some of them are more complex to work out so do we need some sort of on like at the moment we've got you know an online you can take the PGSI online and it spits a number back at you with some information do we need to start packaging and creating uh a, a resource a tool I'm trying to avoid the word intervention um but where you plug in your you know your family income and uh you know how much you're gambling and it spits out at you how you're doing in comparison mm -hmm. with the guidelines is there a way to make these more consumer friendly well we do mm -hmm. have like on gambling help online we have like gambling calculators and yeah. that kind of stuff right where you put in how much you gamble a month or how many times you gamble a month and it spits out that kind of information so it would be easy to be able to say well how does that then compare to those gambling um those lower risk limits sorry david i cut you off <laughs> well i was just going to say that that actually okay. we did the last part of the funding for this project the international project was used for that purpose so there is an online calculator available um fortunately we didn't have any resources to evaluate um its impact or uptake okay. or, where is, is that available. um it's on the canadian center for substance abuse uh, substance use and addiction website so okay. um, I can provide the, the link later and I think that's that's the benefit of, of that study that David was involved in is it it pushed the dissemination further than it had before been before so you know while the the substantive project was about identifying the the guy the the limits and kind of saying yes you know across jurisdictions this seems to be fairly consistent great but I think you did a lot of really nice things to kind of start moving into this space of how do we increase credibility understanding uptake etc so um you know I think that's the movement though but then again that's a funding consideration that um you know we don't if, if it's just going to sit on a dry dusty shelf um and and no one's ever going to see them or use them then what was the point um so yeah, I think this is the next step and I think that that project moved it into that space really nicely despite having limited sort of capacity to do so well thank you so much I apologize we've got a couple of questions just coming through again at the last minute so we haven't had a chance to to get through um but I, I will want to say a huge thank you I found this an incredible
incredibly interesting conversation. My takeaways, it seems at least for, for any early career researchers or people looking for their next project, it seems like the next step is we have well, how do we disseminate and evaluate this information? And I think there's so many different applications and target populations and ways in which that could be done from um, broad public health to targeted communications to very specific tailored uh, feedback. So it'll be really interesting to see how the how the field evolves and takes this amazing work you've done. And I just want to say for, for everyone listening that this work has been decades in the making and it has been incredibly uh, challenging within so many aspects. So I want to personally thank you, you all for the, the efforts you've made because it's been a huge leap forward uh, for gambling research and for, for safer or lower risk gambling. And it, it's something that we're all really grateful for. I think will really change the field, particularly practice and policy. So thank you for your work and thank you so much for your time um, this morning for, for Steph and Nikki and this evening for, for David uh, for sharing this wealth of expertise. Now, being good academics, you can track down these guys online if you want to send them an email or follow up on any of these conversations. But thank you so much uh, for, your, for your time today. It's been a really interesting conversation. Thanks. Well, much. thank you. This is a wonderful <laughs> forum for a nice exchange of ideas that we don't get nearly enough opportunity for. So <laughs> Thank you, uh, Sally, for organizing this. Uh, my absolute pleasure. And a big thank you to Harish and Shine, who organized and the Brain and Mind Center, the, the webinar. And we will see everybody next week. Um, and please do check out the, the YouTube channel if you want to catch up on any of our other webinars. And look forward to uh, hearing from everyone in the audience. If you have any questions, please email them through or any comments. We're always interested to hear feedback on the show. So uh, thank you again.